Welcome to Reputation Nation, the podcast that goes beyond the headlines to unpack corporate crises, legal battles, and the strategies that shape reputations. I'm Anne Marie Malika, the CEO of Desen Hall Resources and crisis management expert. And I'm Stacey Bratcher, a lawyer who's battled crises on the front page and in the courtroom. And sometimes those crises have led me into the foxhole with Anne Marie. Whether you're in the C-suite, the legal department, or are just curious about controversy, we've got you covered. Let's get started. Welcome to Reputation Nation Fast Forward, where Stacy and I will spend a few minutes on headlines that have caught our eye. In each Fast Forward episode, we'll dive into four timely stories where we'll provide a quick summary of why it's interesting to us in the Reputation Nation and leave you with an actionable insight or two. For Des Reads fans, this is the audiovisual version of Des Reads, which was the brainchild of my colleague Josh Culling, but with a slant on what's making headlines in the legal crisis, regulatory, and reputation realm. This week's Fast Forward has a two-letter through line, AI. Artificial intelligence may be changing the way we work, the technology we use, and how we live our lives, but it's also making an impact legally and reputationally. We may be in an AI gold rush, but it can and will be cooled by crisis. Let's get into it. We're kicking things off in the fast four today with Rolling Stone publisher sues Google over AI summaries. This was in the Wall Street Journal. Penske Media Corporation, they're the publisher of Rolling Stone, sued Google claiming that it's AI generated summaries, which if you're Googling anything you're seeing now, unlawfully uses its journalism and has led to significant drop in traffic and revenue for its sites. This lawsuit specifically challenges Google's use of AI to create these summaries, arguing that they diminish user engagement with the original articles and threaten the future of digital media. And I'll admit, I have looked at these summaries if I just needed quick info and I have moved on, not clicking on any of the sources that they come from, which I think is the problem. That's exactly what Penske is raising with the suit. And, you know, what I find really interesting about this particular suit with Penske and Google is that they filed an antitrust lawsuit, whereas others have filed class action cases when it comes to publishing rights. I think this is going to be one that maybe sets a tone, but I'm really curious your take on that. Well, uh, Emory, companies engage in anti-competitive uh, you know, market controlling behavior all the time. And it is a business tactic. I was recently talking with an antitrust defense lawyer and he was telling me about a great result that he got for a client. A CEO gave him a high five with a $500 million settlement. And, and the defense lawyer was sort of, you know, shocked by that. And the CEO said, $500 million for a monopoly I had for 20 years is the sale of the century. So these these tactics are, there's a business reason behind them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that gets to, in our work, defining what your objective is. In so many litigation cases, the goal isn't necessarily to get them thrown out. It's to reduce the liability that you're facing and to the point of the attorney that you talked about with the, their client. $500 million was a fee that they were happy to pay because think of what the upside was on that. And um, you know, for anybody that is potentially up against a company like a Google or in an antitrust monopoly situation, don't expect regulators to do your bidding. And you may need to find other solutions to create revenue. And if you're on the other side of that and you're the, the one that is being the subject of potentially the antitrust litigation, if it works, it works. Well, headline number two is Particle Health versus Epic Systems. Judge rules Epic must face monopoly claims. This was in Stat News. And this is a case that's, that I'm following closely. For those of you not acquainted, Epic Systems is really the largest and most pervasive electronic medical record system in the country. And Particle Health is kind of an up and comer looking at building a payer platform and other information sharing services that for healthcare related entities. So a federal court found that uh, Particle Health could maintain an antitrust uh, case against Epic. This is an interesting, has an interesting story to it. A little over a year, a year and a half ago, Particle Health was caught up in uh, allegations that they misused protected health information as part of a health information exchange. Folks not may not be aware, but there are these sort of collectives where uh, providers and others that have a legitimate reason to access 
what's called PHI can do so through a collective. And Particle Health got investigated by Carry Quality, which is one of those health information exchanges for inappropriate use of PHI. And Epic is a very big member, an influential member in Carry Quality and got Particle. They allege that that Particle was banned and had their access curtailed. So Car- Particle responded and they're represented by Quinn Emanuel, which are a very aggressive law firm. They alleged antitrust against uh, Epic, which I thought was a brilliant move. And uh, just recently, the court held that that case could go forward, challenging Epic's near monopoly in the EMR field. So I'm watching this one. My popcorn is out. I could give folks a lot of tips on uh, maintaining uh, good business practices and not having a monopoly. There's going to be more that comes out on this case, and I'm going to be watching it closely, Anne-Marie. I think we're going to have a lot to talk about. And I think you raised the point of the fact that this is competitor on competitor violence. And this didn't start (laughs) with this lawsuit. This is now the next piece in the corporate lawfare that's occurring. And I'm from Madison, Wisconsin, which is where Epic is based out of. So I have just a natural interest in what happens here. And I think this case is going to have some legs and really potentially set some serious precedent. And the company that's doing this, Particle, is venture-backed. These are aggressive, maybe up and coming that have an investment they want to protect and they are the first, but they probably will not be the last. Amen. I I second that. The actionable insight in the particle versus Epic is when you're up against it, against a big Goliath, like a Google, like an Epic, you need to think creatively about how you can get out of that corner. And I think that's what we saw, what we're seeing in the case that particle brought against Epic. I actually, when the case was announced last summer in 2024, I was actually quite impressed because particle, as I said earlier, was banned, was getting banned from these health information information exchanges, which basically, you know, obfuscated their whole business. So having creative counsel, folks that can think outside the box. And as I think we're going to see, Particle Health is opening the door for a lot more criticism against the Goliath of Epic Systems. I would guess that we're going to see Particle Health out in the world in a bigger way throughout this process and that this lawsuit set the foundation for them to do that. And this is the exact kind of work that we like to do from a high stakes lawfare perspective perspective. And Quinn Emanuel's filing read just like a strategy plan. It's going to be really great to see. All right. Next up, we have clothing manufacturer Sheen um, pulls listing that used Luigi Mangione's likeness to model a shirt. This was an NBC News headline. Um, It was covered pretty broadly. So Sheen is a a company that sells clothes. They put up product photos all the time all over their website and their social channels and their advertising. Um, They used a model that appeared to look like Luigi Mangione, despite the fact he's incarcerated and alleged of committing murder. It really sparks questions about both the marketing side of things, how that impacts the business overall, and also using AI. Sheen's uh, reaction when called to the coin on this was that, you know, we use a third party vendor that uses AI and they put together a picture that just happened to look like this guy. You know, I've got two schools of thought here. One, if I'm Sheen and I'm looking to make headlines and I need to juice sales, no better way to get folks to go look at your website than to do something like this. That is classic PR stunt. However, Um, As a company, they have a lot of reputational challenges already, and I'm more inclined to think somebody didn't talk to somebody else in the marketing department, and this came to be by accident. You know, they're a Chinese company. They're a fast fashion company. They've got a decent amount of Washington issues. There's a lot of regulatory and tariff uh, conversation around things between China and the U.S. right now. So my hope is that they are smart enough to fall into the category of We don't want to actively do any harm. And this was just an unforced error, not something that was orchestrated. But for me, there's a few things that this raises on the AI side of things. These AI systems, these LLMs are being trained in part by what's available on the internet. So if there's a news story about an alleged murderer that is really getting a lot of traffic and that face is in all of the photos that are in Getty Images and elsewhere, 
that's likely going to be something that AI picks up on more so than my picture, which just happens to be in a few places on the internet. That's going to be a real challenge. And I think it's going to be something that both the tech companies running these AI platforms need to look at. And also anybody using AI generated images needs to be mindful of. And the other thing it raises for me is that companies need checks and balances that include humans before things go out. And I think the actionable insight for anyone to take away is if you're going to use AI, you still need human involvement in some capacity. In the marketing case, you know, they need clear approval processes that include real people. So someone is looking at those images and going, oh, maybe that doesn't look quite right. For those using AI for efficiency's sake, you still need to check work because AI is not in a place where it is human. We cannot expect artificial intelligence to fully understand cultural flashpoints, particularly in real time. These LLMs are moving fast, but not fast enough to know that yesterday's news is going to be something that you know, my marketing campaign needs to take into account. Knowing the volume of clothing that Sheen puts out, uh, we talked about this before. It's, it seems very challenging that if they're going to use a different model for all of their pieces that they would be able to catch, even if they had a human in the loop. So your your caution is well taken that folks need to really look closely at the vendors they're using and, and what their AI tools are trained on. And this is a great segue into the next headline, which is about another uh, vendor of many companies called Workday. The headline is what the Workday lawsuit reveals about AI bias and how to prevent it. This was in Forbes. Um, this is a very interesting case to me. It is a lawsuit that was brought by Derek Mobley, Mobley who um, is an African-American. Um, he purports to be over 40 and have certain um, health issues. He applied for more than 100 jobs at different employers, all who used the Workday hiring recruitment platform. And all of those, re all of those applications were rejected. Some of them were, were rejected in the middle of the night. Some of them after, you know, an hour of after he applied. And um, I don't know how he got the goods, but he got information about the algorithm and and was able to show commonality among, at least at this stage, the judge recently approved a collective action, uh, which is a discrimination lawsuit, which is very rare. It is very difficult to, to show that there's been uniform, common practices that have discriminated against groups of people. AI tools are a great way to show that because they're built on algorithms and trained on a, on a certain data set. So this is going to be very interesting and for those of you who may not be aware. Workday is a, is a pervasive, um, very widely used ERP system. And the company themselves said that they, in their court filings, that 1.1 billion applications have been screened using their tool. So this is a class action that of a, of a magnitude we have not ever seen. So again, there's more and more tools out here that, uh, and this Workday is a vendor for many employers. Right. So similar to the Sheen situation, you have vendors using tools and uh, puts an incumbency on the companies that work with those vendors to ensure that they are using those tools fairly and that they're designed fairly. So... It, in hiring, it's, you know, you post one job on LinkedIn and you get thousands of resumes. I guess the one advantage of LinkedIn is that you generally see, maybe it's not an advantage, you see a photo. So you would, if you were using the Workday system and you would see that on LinkedIn and you don't see any African-Americans, that might be a flag to you that something is wrong. I'm curious if it will become apparent throughout the course of this litigation of what folks saw on the hiring manager side versus the ERP itself of, oh, I went in there and I saw a bunch of resumes and everybody's name was Jane Smith or what comes to bear because you know that there will be a very interesting and probably long discovery process. Depositions there could be fascinating. And you and I came together initially on a class action that was pretty large. And this one's going to blow that out of the water. No question. No question. And, I, and to your point, this is a tip of the iceberg because this is a case against the vendor. But I would anticipate that the companies that used this tool will then be next in line. So it really is a call to action for folks to just really do your diligence. And, you know, we are, as we said at the outset, in an AI gold rush, everyone is excited. People are moving fast, but sometimes you got to go slow to go fast. 
Here's your actionable insight on this one. If you use Workday at your organization, or if you don't know if you use Workday at your organization and you're in comms and legal, you need to find out to start prepping for what may be next because it is Workday that's in the hot seat right now. But if we know anything about what class action litigation looks like, it's always the downline companies next and there is nothing stopping that. So look hard, look quickly and get ready. That's it for this episode of Reputation Nation. Thanks for joining us. We hope you found this episode useful. Have a crisis you want to dissect on a future episode? Connect with us on LinkedIn or email us at repnat at desenhall.com. Want to learn more about navigating a corporate crisis or high stakes lawfare situation? Or want more hot takes from us? Subscribe to Des Reads and our take at desenhall.com. And be sure to check out Stacy's The Legal Department podcast for more legal insights at legaldepartmentpod.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time in the Reputation Nation.